I talk a lot about the transcendental, transcendental black metal, transcendental Kabbalah, and I wanted to explain a bit of what I mean by the term transcendental in those contexts. So I made a diagram. I mean four things, and my sense is that history has so far produced four meanings for the idea of the transcendental, and uh, that these need to sort of all be synthesized in some way. The uh, oldest sense of the term transcendental is maybe also the most like well known. I think people tend to know what transcendental meditation is. Um, like David Lynch promotes it. I don't practice it myself though I've tried it, but um, I have this book by the Maharishi. Um, so this is a fairly contemporary book, but it's also as old as Parashat. Um, this is kind of like the oldest one of the oldest spiritual texts. And the basic idea in this sense of the term is that um, the transcendental is some kind of like loving collective mind that is all things and is also me. And I could access it uh, using sort of physical techniques like practices of sort of meditation or creation or whatever and that the default state is to kind of care about worldly concerns and desires that are actually sort of misplaced and there's this great joy in kind of making contact with the transcendental. In medieval times a new concept was born. Um, this is a book by Aquinas or part of one book by Aquinas. And this m turns into a Trinitarian conception of the transcendental. Um, and it's something that is accessed by uh, a mix of philosophical speculation and revelation. And it's very tied, very much tied to the truth of the incarnation and resurrection of Christ. And the key is that the transcendental involves three forms, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And they're tied together in one love or justice. And there's a lot of speculation, a lot of ink spilts, blood spilts, you know, over whether, um, whether that means there's a fourth transcendental that's the one or whether there's just three. But in any case, that's another important conception. So these are both ancient conceptions of the transcendental that are essentially religious and rely on uh, revelation from God in some way or another. But then there are two modern conceptions that were born in the wake of the scientific revolution uh, when the success of mathematical physics began calling into question the possibility of um, philosophy really having access to the metaphysical realm at all. And so transcendental philosophy really means um, a form of philosophy that is constantly critiquing its own presuppositions and is aimed at a realm that um, is neither in the soul nor out in the world, but is this condition of possibility of thought or perception. Or in any case, that is the Kantian version of the transcendental. You know, Kant conceives the transcendental subject with like, it's like intuition, sensation, intellect, reason, imagination, as a kind of like static window between the inside and the outside. Hegel imagines it to be something very different, something that evolves over the course of history. But in both cases, and so, so absolute idealism would be Hegel, something like transcendental skepticism or transcendental idealism would be Kant. But in, in both cases, the 
um, the norms of the mind, the, the sort of the ideals of goodness and stuff are kind of, they're guiding the process. They're sort of meant to be preserved. With libidinal materialism, which is exemplified by Nietzsche, this refers to kind of like the space, the kind of conceptual void where different rational transcendental horizons can appear. And the, you know, the big difference between these is really, it's really a question of kind of whether history will be something that is integrated by the mind, by society, and still animated by the ideals of, say, the Christian transcendental, or whether, whether like our values are really something that can and should ultimately be discarded, even the ones we hold most sacred. So, so yeah, which of these conceptions of the transcendental do I ascribe to? Sort of, as I was saying, I kind of see these as like co-equal. Humans don't really understand what any of these four things mean yet. And typically a thinker of whatever kind will choose one of these orientations and discard the others and not, not take the others seriously. And the key to me, I think, is to imagine that the antinomies between the ancient and modern conceptions and the kind of formal and material conceptions, uh, these kind of two, two like parameters on this matrix, to imagine that those will somehow be uh, transcended um, or could be through a total art praxis. I don't think that I'm the first person to have this conception exactly. I think I have one more book to show you. In a lot of ways, Emerson, uh, who is an American philosopher, I really to kind of take, feel a sense of identification with Emerson and like continuing uh, his tradition of philosophy. He kind of combined the religious and the kind of critical senses of transcendental but he didn't do it in a systematic a way. My, so my four cardinals, the doctrine of the four cardinals, ascesis, catharsis, fervor, and majesty, basically turns the question of the four transcendentals into an epistemology. So it's like these are sort of four modes of knowing, um, four avenues along which uh, practice can unfold. I mean, these are just two questions that, for me personally, are not resolved, right? Like, if you take for granted that philosophy can't get to the bottom of things on its own, you know, does that mean that, so ancient versus modern, does that mean that revelation has to take over from God, ancient, or that a process of critique that kind of is a generational intensification or accumulation where thought becomes more and more radical. That's, that's the modern version, you know, which I, I don't really, I'm not satisfied with either of those accounts. And they, I, I like wonder how they could be synthesized. And then similar with form versus matter, there's just this question of like, how much the conscious mind and currently existing explicable ideals uh, are meant to control and be involved in this process. So on the side of form, you can imagine the mind's kind of ex expanding uh, with each new eon, where it still ultimately contains contains the process, the, like, the, like the trinity never goes away, the true good and the beautiful reign, versus the idea that like, you know, what's coming next is truly beyond comprehension to us. And, you know, conscious aims and values are, you know, limited and relative. Um, and it's actually the body and the work of art, uh, basically, the, the act that will kind of pave the way to the resolution of the, the problem, the problem of humanity or whatever. That's another thing I didn't mention, which is that in libidinal materialism versus absolute idealism, that like on the side of form, it's like philosophy is really kind of the highest. 
Um, whereas in the side of matter, it's really more the arts. The, the, the arts are certainly playing a major role. So, yeah, there you go. The transcendental. <laughs>